Welcome to the Faith Lutheran Church Bible Study, The Triumph of the Lamb, a study in Revelation. Tonight in our Wednesday class, we discuss the messages of the three angels and the harvest of the earth from Revelation chapter 14. Let's listen in. Father, thanks for this time together and for this opportunity to study your word. And as we go through uh, some very powerful and difficult texts tonight, we ask you, Father, to guide us according to your will and give us your spirit so we would hear your word faithfully. We pray that you would hear our prayers tonight and answer them as you promised to do. We thank you, Lord, for the little bit of rain you gave us today. And any more you want to send our way, we would be greatly uh, appreciative of that. Uh, Because it is very dry here, Lord, and we need the help. So please send us rain. Uh, we pray tonight for Janice as her back is in a bad way and her leg is hurting as a result. I pray, Lord, that tonight you would take this away and you would grant her comfort. Uh, please give her healing and strength so that she and Tom can enjoy themselves tomorrow at the Phantom. Lord, please uh, grant her strength tonight. We pray for Carrie and her struggles. We pray for peace of mind and comfort in her heart. Lord, have mercy on her. We pray for Al as he's between facilities right now. Continue to care for him and watch over him and be with Betty as she supports him. Uh, Give both of them strength and healing. And we pray for Tim and Bev as well, that you would give them strength and healing. healing. Strengthen them, Lord, uh, in what they're going through right now. And we pray that Tim would recover quickly so he can uh, have the surgery he needs. Uh, We ask all of this in the name of your Son, Jesus, who is our Lord and Savior. Amen. Okay. um, So I got made fun of this morning for this, but I'm going to do it again tonight anyhow. Uh... We're going to go real quickly through the first five verses of Revelation 14 just to bring ourselves back up to speed because it's been a couple weeks since we've been uh, been in it. Uh, And then we'll just go real quickly through those and on into the messages of the three angels and see how far we get. Okay? Uh, If you came here tonight to think that you were going to talk about uh, the gay marriage issue and the SCOTUS business, you can watch our little video online uh, about all of that from Sunday's class. Um, If you have pressing questions on that, again... Send them to Jeff Mark, uh, and, he, and Dave, Dave is off the hook. Yeah, so uh, so tonight, if someone wouldn't mind, if you could, I will work real quickly through the first five verses, and then we'll move on from there. Okay. Uh, remember, we're in the fourth vision. We've been seeing the attacks of the beast and the devil, and all of the the, uh, the, the dragon and the two beasts, and how they are attacking the the bride, uh, or I should say, excuse me, the woman and her offspring. And, um, and now we're seeing the victory of Christ over all of that which has opposed his church. Then I looked, and behold, on the Mount Zion there stood the Lamb. Who is the Lamb? Jesus. And with him 144,000. Who is? Militant. The church militant, who had the name of the Father written on their foreheads. And I heard the voice from heaven like a roar of many waters and the sound of a loud thunder. Uh, the voice I heard was like the sound of harpists playing on their harps. I think, Dave, the more I think about this, it's a, it's a loud and terrifying sound, but it's beautiful. I think that's what you want to take from it. Not merely, oh, it's just a bunch of harpists. Yeah. But it, he sets it up very scary and then describes it in beautiful notes, so to speak. So, so perhaps that's what you have there. Um, because on the, on, and what we're going to see here is for the church, this coming is a beautiful thing. But for those who stand opposed to the church, it's like a flood of water is going to wash them out. Right? It's a double-edged sword. Yeah, correct. Exactly. Uh, And they were singing a new song before the throne and before the four living creatures and before the elders. And no one could learn the song except the 144,000 who had been redeemed from the earth. Uh, The song is new. This reminds us of the Psalms where the Israelites who were redeemed from the land came back into the promised land and they sang new songs, songs of deliverance, different songs than they sang while they were in exile. Because while they were in exile, uh, they sang songs of, of lamentation and burden and sorrow and longing for their home. But those songs came to an end when they marched back into Zion. So the songs that are sung here are the songs of the redeemed who have left this veil of tears and are now entering into the glory of Christ. Um, only the 144,000 can learn it. Only the church, that is, can learn it because the church is the only ones who are redeemed. Uh, they are the only ones who are saved from this veil of tears. And we will see shortly what happens to those who stand opposed to the church and everything that takes place uh, for them. Um, these are those who have not been defiled with women or who have not defiled themselves with women for they are virgins. All this means is... Um, that they have not worshipped uh, the false gods. Remember, we go back to the beginning of the book 
and the seven letters, and uh, one church was accused of sort of uh, courting Jezebel, sleeping with Jezebel. Uh, this church is uh, not those who have slept with um, uh, the idolaters. Remember, idolatry, adultery go hand in hand. And we'll talk more about that. This will be a little clearer as we get into the three uh, angels. Okay. Um, also, before folks went off into war in those days, the men were not to have sexual relations with their wives in preparation for battle. You know, their energy was supposed to be focused on one thing only. Uh, and so this 144,000 is a military number that reminds us of the 144,000 from all those chapters ago uh, where the people of God were organized, uh, so to speak, uh, for spiritual warfare. It's those who have not defiled themselves with virgins. Uh, it's these who have followed the Lamb wherever he goes. They're followers of Christ. Um, they have been redeemed from mankind as the first fruits for God and for the Lamb. First fruits is, is sacrifice language in the Old Testament. And uh, in the Old Testament, uh, the first fruits that grew up of your crop were to be offered to God as a thanksgiving offering. These are those who have given their lives in thanksgiving to God. And in their mouth, no lie was found. They are blameless. They did not speak the lies of the beast or the dragon or... Uh, the other beast, uh, they spoke the truth of God. Okay, uh, and So this is who is on the scene here uh, with Christ, the church militant. Thank you, Ron. And do you know where, you, where I got this mug? Yes, I do. I got it from you. I know you do. Yes. <laughs> and it's bigger than my other ones. That's why I like it. <laughs> Thank you, Ron. Okay. It's very kind of you. Thank you. All right. Any questions so far? Oh, good. Now we get into the scary stuff. This is not the happiest chapter in the Bible. <laughs> okay. Um, so here we go. C could someone read for us 6 through 13, please? Marjorie, go for it. Then I saw another angel flying in midair, and he had the eternal gospel to proclaim to those who live on the earth, to every nation, tribe, language, and people. He said in a loud voice, Fear God and give him glory, because the hour of his judgment has come. Worship him who made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and the springs of water. A second angel followed and said, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great, which made all the nations drink the maddening wine of her adulteries. A third angel followed them and said in a loud voice, if anyone worships the beast and his image and receives his mark on the forehead or on the hand, he too will drink of the wine of God's fury, which has been poured full strength into the cup of his wrath. He will be tormented with burning sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment rises forever and ever. There is no rest, day or night, for those who worship the beast and his image or for anyone who receives the mark of his name. This calls for patient endurance on the part of the saints who obey God's commandments and remain faithful to Jesus. Then I heard a voice from heaven That's saying, other, uh, I think that's... Oh, no, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. One more. <laughs> then I heard a voice from heaven <coughs> say, Right, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, they will rest from their labor, for their deeds will follow them. All right. Uh, okay, so here we go. Uh, three angels show up onto the scene now, and they have uh, something to proclaim. What is it that they are said to have proclaimed here? Eternal gospel. An eternal gospel. Now, what does the word gospel mean? Goodness. And where is that in the text? <laughs> Where's good news? Yeah, where's the good news in this text? It's not really there. <laughs> there ain't a whole lot of good news here. Uh, in the scriptures, um, the word gospel is used in two senses. We'll call one the broad sense and the other the narrow sense. In the broad sense, the gospel refers to uh, the entirety of Jesus' ministry. Um, so what we would confess in the Apostles' Creed, perhaps, uh, probably better said, like when you, when you start reading Mark's gospel, it says this is the gospel of Jesus Christ. This is the good news of Jesus who is the Christ, okay? And then it proceeds to tell you law and gospel stuff. It tells you commandments he has, condemnations he gives, things he's upset about, woes, all of these sorts of things, law kind of things. Uh, but it also shows us good news stuff, forgiveness, life, salvation, all of those things. 
All of that, in the broad sense, falls under the heading of gospel. Uh, that's the broad sense. Sometimes, however, uh, the New Testament uses the word gospel to refer specifically to uh, Jesus Christ for you for the forgiveness of your sins. Jesus died for you. The, the proclamation of the good news. Uh, and there it would distinguish law from gospel. Law being what God commands, gospel being what God does for us in Christ Jesus. Do you see the difference there? So every now and then, gospel refers to it in the, gospel is a broad sense term, the entirety of Jesus' ministry, and other times it refers specifically to the good news of Christ for our salvation. In Lutheran language, when we speak in terms of law and gospel, we're, we're generally talking about we're generally talking about the specific sense we usually mean the specific sense however uh, there are times when gospel has a broader meaning I think this is one of those points part of the ministry of Christ is the judgment on the last day uh, and so I think that's what we see going on here he will come again to judge the living and the dead and that's what's going on in this in this text okay um, but there is a part that this is, of this that is truly gospel and that's in verse 13 uh, blessed are yes who die in the yes Lord. So you've got the, the uh, comparison between those who reject Christ right. and the judgment that they will be yeah. under, which is just pure law. Yeah. And then that part, which is the gospel, good news for those who believe. Correct. Um, yes, very good. That's, that's a good point. So there is gospel in the text. Uh, the other thing to think is this, and this is a, it's a hard one to navigate around, um, or navigate through perhaps. Uh, and that is the idea that when the enemies of the church are defeated, that is actually good news for the church on a certain level. If you think of the Nazis and the Holocaust and you have the Jews sitting in the um, concentration camps, when the news came in that the Nazis had been defeated, their enemies and their oppressors were being conquered, that was good news for them. When Cyrus in the Old Testament comes into Babylon and conquers the Babylonians and tells the Israelites, you're going back, or the Jews, you're going back to your land, uh, that was good news for them. The defeat of their enemies was gospel. Uh, though for the enemies themselves, this is no gospel. This is, this is bad news. This is condemnation and judgment. Okay? Go ahead, Tom. Uh, my brother and I got into a discussion one time, and he told me that, in fact, he fears God. Yeah, good. That was the next question. Good. When we say fear God, what do we mean? What do you think? Does it mean to be terrified of God? Um, well, fear making him unhappy with you, for sure. Okay, why? What, explain that fear to me. Well, I have a son to protect me from that, but um, just God made his creation to to do his will. Mm -hmm. um, and to not do that would make God very happy. Invokes his wrath, correct. Yes, very good. And that is a terrifying thing. Yes. Why, Tom? Well, um, the, the, the short of the yeah. conversation mm -hmm. we had, it was a very long conversation. Um, my brother thought, feared God because God could condemn him. Mm -hmm. And I really thought that was, that was a distinct possibility, mm -hmm. that he would be condemned. And I said, I fear God out of respect, mm -hmm. you know, because I respect the authority and the absoluteness of God. Mm -hmm. And to me, that um, to, to be hmm. to be just a, a, a human and stand before God um, would be a, would be a fearful thing, I suppose, mm -hmm. because I'm, I'm so inadequate. Mm -hmm. But that's the only fear. I don't have a fear about going to hell or any of that sort of stuff. So I'm not fearing that God is going to condemn me somehow. Why? Why do you not fear that you're going to hell? Because I have salvation through Jesus Christ. Through Jesus Christ, correct. Okay. So. Um, in the Catechism, what do we say at the, in the Ten Commandments? All right, you who remember your catechisms now, when we go through the Ten Commandments, what do we say? We believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven. Or, or we say, sorry, we say, uh, I believe, uh, you shall have no other gods before you. What does this mean? You've got to remember the commandments first. Uh, you shall have no other gods before you. What does this mean? Who, who can tell me? God is jealous. No, no, no. What does the Catechism say? Oh. You should fear and love God. See, now Janice, Janice. keeps the star Janice because she's got the catechism. All right. You should fear and love God so that you do not, et cetera, et cetera, for each of the commandments. And in the first commandment, you should fear and love God above all things. And there when we talk of fear, 
Uh, it, it kind of depends. I'm trying to figure out a good way of describing this, so we'll play with some metaphors tonight. It kind of depends on where you're standing. If you're standing behind Jesus when God shows up, your fear is one of reverence and awe. If you're on the other side of Jesus and facing God only in his wrath and fury, it is utter terror. It is Revelation 14 stuff. Because those who stand apart of Christ have every reason to be terrified of what God will uh, pour out upon them. So, in Christ, fear is something different than outside of Christ. And, this should be noted for us Christians that we should then fear anything that might distract us from Jesus. Fe- not may, Perhaps, not fear those things, but fear what happens if we follow those things. That's what I want to say. Fear what happens if we follow those things away from Christ. Because what happens is, outside of Christ, there is no salvation. Now, Rome will say, outside of the church, there is no salvation. We'll say, yes, if you mean those who are in Christ. Um, so in Christ, we need not fear the wrath of God, though there is still this sort of, he's my father, and I respect him, and I honor him, and I love him, and I don't want to move away from Christ. Uh, at the same time, outside of Christ, the, I've heard one pastor say it this way, if you face the judgment outside of Christ, you've experienced as much of God's mercy as you'll ever experience. And that is a terrifying thing, quite frankly. That is something to fear. Okay. Um, so I guess I would say, when we say fear God, who, who are you talking to? Where are you standing? Where is that person standing? When the angel says this, fear God and give him glory, the church hears one thing, and those who are marked by the beast hear another. Does that make sense? Okay. All right. What's the <laughs> word that translates into fear? Uh... uh I think it's phobu. Phobos. I remember, I remember phobos. being told that the Greek does not use the word that translates exactly into fear, that it can just more precisely translated into respect and hold in high regard. Okay. The English the translation is where the afraid... The afraidness comes. You know, I'd have to look for you. Um... That's a curious thing to say, Keith, because I would be very interested. If you give me two seconds, I could go look. Um, and the other thing you want to keep in mind is this. With Greek words, and this is the same in English language, context often dictates what each word means. Uh, and so the context here, um, the terror aspect seems to be more emphasized than the respect aspect. Because what we're about to see is terrifying. It's not just, oh, well, my, that was just. It's terrifying, though it is just. It's a terrifying justice. So uh, context is going to dictate it more than the word itself. So I'd have to look that up for you. Um, but, I, but I think it's phobu is the Greek, and that, that can mean fear. Like when the women saw Jesus, they were uh, sore afraid. Or when uh, Mary saw the angel, she was sore afraid, and it wasn't a sort of healthy respect. If you'll forgive this next statement, but this is what my professor at seminary said. It's a more of, oh, they just filled their pants kind of fear. (laughs) That's what they've just seen. So context is going to dictate a lot of that. Um, So I love the Hiller translation. The Hiller translation is worth your time. (laughs) Okay, so this is what he says. And now why should we be afraid of the creator of all things? All right. Wait a minute. Yep. I've recently heard, I'm not sure where, whether it was you or another preacher, but when you're in the judgment, you're not to be afraid. You are not because you're in Christ. But but don't, okay, again. I don't think, here's what I want to say. I don't think that when you are standing, when you see Christ return in his glory, your control of your emotions is is not something to worry about. It will, if you see Christ and you will say, ha, look at that. Oh, he was right. (laughs) Here he comes. And you're not going to be worried about if you're scared or not. Uh, For those 
who are outside, it will be utter terror. They will be afraid because they'll say, we've been wrong this whole time, and we'll see what that entails here in a few minutes. But you don't have to worry about, will I be afraid or not? You'll see Jesus, and your, your thoughts of yourself will be no more because you'll simply be seeing Christ, and Christ will fill you all in all. So, um, so what I would say to you is now... Sheldon, you don't need to fear the judgment now because you are in Christ and you were baptized and you were washed in the blood. You do not need to fear. Your judgment has taken place on the cross. That's what Tom's getting at earlier. He doesn't fear God in that way because his sins have been dealt with in Christ. Um, But if you want to deal with God apart from your sin, uh, uh, if you want to deal with God apart from Christ, then we have every reason to say you you should be terrified of that. Does that make sense? Yes. Go ahead. Mm-hmm. And I think that's where my brother was coming from. Yeah. Because he is very much a works-oriented yeah. individual. So to him, he looks around himself and says, holy mackerel, I better fear God. Yeah, right, right, right. And and then I will find justification in my fear. See, God, I was scared yeah. of you the whole time. Yeah. And it's like, well, you didn't have to be because have no fear, little flock, is, a, is something Jesus says to you. You have no... F- I mean, think of this. Read this passage... Uh, Guys, this passage is not so much for you. The passage for you is, have no fear, little flock. It's the Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. I mean, think of that. Oh, that's the one I should have read this morning. That would have been nice. <laughs> uh, but yeah, see, that's something else. So, um, Okay, so here we go. Um, the other, there was one illustration I want to use, and I, I like the illustration. I'm going to stick with the illustration, even though I screwed it up in every class I've done. I, I've been watching this show called on the History Channel. It's also on Netflix. It's called um, Men Who Built America. Have you guys seen this show? Yeah. Okay. So it's a story of, like the Vanderbilts and the Rockefellers uh, and all of these guys, and it is it is just fascinating. The post Civil War, what happens to the country? It's all falling apart. And it's talking about these entrepreneurs who kind of rebuild with industry and, and all this kind of stuff. Uh, and there's a great story about Rockefeller, who is the who's the oil tycoon, right? Uh, Rockefeller kind of runs the the railway because he has the oil and he keeps these guys in business. Well, he's got a deal with Vanderbilt. Uh, and Vanderbilt's competitor comes to Rockefeller and, and I can't remember his name. I think it's Lee or something like this. Uh, he comes, he comes to Rockefeller and he says, "I'm going to make you a better deal than Vanderbilt is giving you." And he kind of starts trying to ease his way in there. And Rockefeller says, "Bottom line, what can you do for me?" And the guy sells him a better deal and he says I'm going with you Vanderbilt's out well Vanderbilt is offended by this he is furious so he gets together with his rival whose name is I think it's he uh, gets together with his rival um, who also ends up being Carnegie's Carnegie's uh, ends up being Carnegie's uh, mentor he gets together and says you know what we could run Rockefeller out we could we could if we united the railroads together we could crush Rockefeller and he would bow to us. And the other guy says, fantastic. This is before monopolies are an actual illegal thing. They're, they just run monopolies, right? Uh, so they, they team up against Rockefeller. So Rockefeller is furious and, the, and he ends up kind of beating both of them. Uh, but Rocke, the, the line that the historian used was, uh, Rockefeller showed Lee mercy. And Lee took advantage of his mercy and, and left his mercy and made a deal with Vanderbilt. Uh, and if you're going to if you're going to reject the mercy of Rockefeller, you should expect the wrath of Rockefeller. That's what's going on here. It's a long story, but I think it's interesting. But it's exactly what's going on here. If you're going to reject the mercy of Christ, if you're going to reject the salvation that God gives in Christ, then don't expect the salvation of Christ. You expect the wrath of God. The only place that we are hidden from the wrath of God is in Christ. Nowhere else. Nowhere else. It's Jesus alone. And nothing else justifies us before God. Okay? Uh, and so that's the idea of what we're going to see here in a little bit. Those who have worked against the church, those who have bowed to the beasts, those who have gone the way of the dragon, who have not found um, um, safety from God, so to speak, in Christ, will now deal with his wrath. And that's what the angels are bringing. So the next thing is, fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. She who made all nations drink the wine of the passion of her sexual immorality. Now remember, 
idolatry and adultery in the Old Testament go hand in hand. The great illustration for idolatry is adultery. Uh, and so here, the Babylon the Great is the one who has been seducing uh, the people away from the church, away from Christ. Now our line from the previous section about virgins and those who have not defiled themselves with women makes more sense. Uh, it, what it's saying is they have not gone off to worship the false gods. They have not gone off to worship Babylon, the remaining faithful uh, to their Lord. Make sense? Babylon, however, um, is, is bad news. Now, this is the first time we've experienced or heard of Babylon in Revelation. It is not the last time. Uh, someone help me out. Um, who is Babylon? Where do they come from? What is their role in the Bible? Evil city in an immoral empire. Evil city in an immoral empire. At what point, Sheldon? <clears throat> like where? And tell me their story a little bit. Babylon ransacked Jerusalem and carried the people of Judea into captivity. There we are. So, in the Old Testament, God used Babylon to bring it, uh, the Jews into captivity because they had broken covenant with him. Uh, Babylon, someone had this in their note this morning, was kind of the center of political uh, uh, political influence, cultural influence, religious influence in the world. They were the most powerful nation at the time um, in the world. And they defeated Israel. They worked against the people of God. Now, God used them to do it, and then later on, God punished them for it. Um, but what happened in Babylon is they would go around, if I remember my history correctly, they would go around and they would take the best of every other culture that they had conquered and sort of um, mix it into their own life. Okay, so um, think of the book of Daniel. You guys read the book of Daniel? Good book. Check it out sometime. Uh, they defeat the Israelite, the, the Jews, and they, they bring them into captivity, and they find from among the Jews uh, the best, the brightest, uh, you know, the, the top notch A plus students, whatever you want to say. Uh, and they say, uh, okay, you're now in the king's court, and we're going to use you for your wisdom and your insight on how to run the world and all that kind of stuff. Uh, and so that's how Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego all end up being part of uh, Nebuchadnezzar's court. Now, they end up not doing what Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar wants, and they suffer for it, uh, though God saves them, and then Nebuchadnezzar himself ultimately repents. Um, but the idea is uh, that they're going to do this. They're going to take all the, the best of all the cultures and bring it up into their culture to make their culture stronger and richer and deeper. It's actually, for a political system, a pretty wise move. It's, it's going to help you stay strong for a long time because you're not just creating... What's happening is they're not creating rebels, right? They're not capturing all these people and then just oppressing them and then those people all get together and say, you know, we should, we should overthrow these guys. Instead, what they're saying is, oh, no, 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 no. You can keep the best of what is your culture. You just have to do it the way we tell you to do it. And so they feel a little more welcome. All right. Um, they do this with the gods as well. Because in those days, it was believed if a nation conquered another nation, it was one nation's god defeating the other nation's god. Um, so the gods of Babylon had defeated the gods of Israel. Now, what Israel says, what God says in the Old Testament is, uh, they haven't defeated me. I let them win because you Israelites needed to be punished for what for disobeying me. But I'll conquer them soon. Don't worry, and I'll give you back the land. Um, now, all this is to say that's who Babylon is. They're kind of the boogeyman, the worst of the bad guys. In the five first five books, it's Egypt. They're the big bad guys. As you make your way through, it becomes Assyria, then Babylon. Now, we've talked about this already. In John's day, who's the big bad boogeyman? Who's the worst nation at the time for the church? Rome, Rome. So Babylon at this point is symbolic of all those powers that oppose the church, uh, but specifically at this time it's going to be referring to Rome. And we'll see later on that Babylon is described as um, the whore of Babylon who rides on the back of a dragon. Uh, it's the political and the religious beast working together uh, against the church. That's what Babylon ultimately is. This is what my note says. Babylon is a symbol of the two beasts in their most deadly form. When the harlot sits on the beast, that is when false religious entities, in particular apostate Christianity, 
attempt to use or work with the existing political and social power to destroy the Church of Christ. So, uh, when the false religious entities use or work with existing political and social powers to destroy the Church of Christ. Okay? Um, that's what you can read into Babylon. Why specifically apostate Christianity? Uh, because... People who have left the church, right? Yes, okay. apostate Christianity is those who have left the church because typically those who left the church uh, do so to bow to the state. But they don't do it... Um, they do it using Christian lingo. Um, so they still look Christian in practice, but in doctrine uh, are not such because they're teaching the, to bow to something else. Uh, with the spirit of the day, if you will. All right. But they may even claim to still be. Correct. They may they may do it in the name of the Lord, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, wolves in sheep's clothing. There you are. Right. Wolves in sheep clothing. There you are. Uh, Saint Paul. If someone comes and preaches a different Jesus than the one I give to you, let them be anathema. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. Oh, so fun. Okay, and another angel. Can, can we, before you go there, yes, please. Um, it says, and that may be anyways, I'm translated to drink um, the Great Babylon, the great Babylon um, which made all nations drink the maddening wine of their adulteries. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> maddening wine. Mm -hmm. So, in those days, um, they didn't have um, regulations on how to make wine. So you made wine, and it was incredibly alcohol-heavy. So they had to dilute it. Um, so you would, you would pour tons of water into the wine so that it was actually not going to destroy you. Um, so maddening wine would just be, I, I think it's probably best translated, undiluted wine. A oh, really, really strong Yeah, really strong wine. Because what happens when you drink really strong wine? You cannot defend yourself, yeah. right? So um, there it is. We call it moonshine. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> moonshine. <laughs> The moonshine of Babylon. Ever distill any ever clear? They couldn't make it. Yeah. No, it was for men. Still market under ever clear. Yeah. So I don't, I don't know how strong it would be. But. I, yeah, I can't see how it would be any stronger than the wine would be. Well, I would, I would venture to guess. <clears throat> human nature being the way it is, they found ways to make yeah. it stronger. I don't, I, I can't explain Fermentation how. Fermentation strengthens the alcohol. Does it? Grog. You've all heard of it. Right, and watered down rum, mm. but it fermented. Yeah, I don't know. Pyrotology. Yeah, I don't know how strong you can get something by fermenting it, but it's not nearly as strong as it if you distill it. Is that right? Oh, yeah. Well, the the whole idea here is this is this is undiluted wine, yeah. which would so. in those for whatever reason in those days would have been very bad news. This is always something, by the way, with your Baptist friends. Uh, who want to tell you that the wine at the Lord's Supper was basically just grape juice because there wasn't that much alcohol in it? Probably not. Probably not. Uh, there weren't. They didn't have the blue laws yet, you know. So, all right. Um, or the other. Someone did note to me the other day. Someone did note to me the other day in the story of um, Jesus turning the water into wine. The wine wasn't gone until the apostles showed up. I just want to throw that out there. Right? It, was, it, was, it was fine until they got there. And then Jesus had to make up for them. So that's something worth thinking about. All right. I don't know if that's true or not. I mean, yeah, that's right. All right. So another angel, a third, followed them, saying with a loud voice, if any... Oh, no, real quick. Before we move on from the wine jokes, I found a French wine at Trader Joe's... Uh, on Monday, and the, it's called Revelation. And I think for our last class, <laughs> I'm going to buy a bottle of it and we're going to have a glass of wine for this thing uh, wow. and be done. It's only six bucks. It's fantastic. Yeah. It's, all right. All right. Uh, so, all right. You can't make Revelation that cheap. This is, this is the diluted stuff, okay? Is it a red wine? Yes. Yes, yes. All right. So, uh, speaking of wine, we'll get on into this. Then the third angel comes, and if anyone worships the beast in its image and receives the mark on his forehead or on his hand, he will also drink the wine of God's wrath. So you have the, wrath, the wine of Babylon, and now you have God's wrath of wine, God's cup of anger. Uh, 
poured full strength, uh, God's wine of, wine of God's wrath poured full strength into the cup of his anger. And he will be tormented with fire and sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And, their torment of, and the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night. These are the worshipers of the beast in its image, and whoever receives the mark... Uh, of its name. So these are those who have rejected the salvation that has been gra- offered to them, granted to them in Jesus Christ, and have chosen to worship the beast. And here is the wrath that comes upon them. Those who want to work very hard at saying there is no eternal hell in the Bible have no leg to stand on in light of these verses. And these verses are more terrifying. Uh, than anything else I think we have up to this point in the scriptures. This is an utterly terrifying picture. And it's not even, we always say this, uh, hell is the absence of God. Well, apparently it's not. But rather, torture in the presence of Christ. Torture how? I think the the fire and the sulfur and all this is is imagery of some awful place. Um, But I think what the, the image you want to have here is one of hopelessness that here is Christ with no more hope for you because you've worshipped the beast. This is not purgatory or anything of that nature. Uh, This is hopelessness. The salvation, the point of salvation is gone. Go ahead, Tom. And you couldn't, you cannot accidentally get there. Correct. This is, uh, this is not someone who has been uh, in the church hearing the word, believing, and then, you know, Jesus came back and they said a cuss word and now they're going to hell or something like this. Like this is those who are marked by the beast and have rejected God. Okay, These verses are not for, and this is brought up this morning, these verses are not for your friend who is in utter despair and hates God because they're convinced God has rejected them and there's no hope for them. To them, the promise of forgiveness is the one thing you want to give. For someone who is in despair and fear over God, don't read Revelation 14. These kind of texts have already done their work on them. What these people need is ears filled with the promise, have no fear, little flock. It's the Father's good pleasure to give you, you who I'm speaking to right now, the kingdom. And he's giving it to you in these words. Do you understand that? This is a warning to those who are are militantly rejecting the gospel. All right? And I mean, all the, and all those who have rejected Christ. So this would include the people of other religions and all of that other stuff as well. Uh, but here specifically, it's dealing with those who are working militantly against the church. Okay? All right. Um, militantly could be heavy too. I mean, purposely. Okay, good enough. All right. Um... Let's see. The, this idea of the cup of God's wrath. Dave, is your uh, st- are you still in Jeremiah 25 from this morning? Oh, Come <laughs> on. And Marjorie, are you still in Psalm 75? Yes. Let's go, you guys. Look at that. He is. Um, can you read for me Jeremiah 25, 15, and 16, and then Marjorie 75, 7, and 8? Okay. This is Jeremiah 25, verse 15 and 16. <clears throat> this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, said to me. Take from my hand this cup filled with the wine of my wrath and make all the nations to whom I send uh, send you drink it. When they drink it, they will stagger and go (coughs) mad because of the sword I will send among them. So there we see in Jeremiah God describing this, the wine of his wrath. Now the wine, again, it's this undiluted kind of, it causes them to stagger and be incapable of defending themselves. Uh, this is how we stand before the wrath of God. Okay, um, And the Psalm 75, 7 and 8. But it is God who judges. He brings one down. He exalts another. In the hand of the Lord is a cup full of foamy wine mi- mixed with spices. He pours it out and all the wicked of the earth drink it down to its very dregs. Okay, um, now, these two are very harsh pictures of the wine of God's wrath, the cup of God's wrath. Yeah. We hear of this cup of God's wrath at a very particular place in the New Testament. Does anyone recall where that is? Very important part of the New Testament. In the garden. In the garden. Of, of Jesus says, of Gethsemane. Gethsemane. When Jesus says, 
if it be thy will. Let this cup Let this pass cup from me, pass. but not my will, your will Let be your done. Will be so these two verses, Psalm 75, Jeremiah 25, where are they fulfilled in the New Testament? On the cross. Who drinks the cup of God's wrath? Jesus does. For you and for everyone. And if someone decides they would like to take a sip themselves, this is what they'll get. You see? This is Christ. This, again, this is what we say. Look, uh, dear angry militant non-believer, God has wrath towards you that Christ has drunk for you. He staggered his way to the cross and died your death. You are free from that. You are forgiven. You need not endure that wrath anymore. And those who take that mercy and they, they, those who reject Rockefeller's mercy, they will get Rockefeller's wrath, you see. Those who reject Christ's mercy will then face the wrath of God. That's, it's the terrifying stuff. These verses are not intended to comfort. They are intended to strike fear in our hearts and to drive us to the mission of proclaiming good news to the unbeliever who does not need to endure this wrath because that wrath was taken for them by Jesus. Does that make sense? Okay. Okay. Um, tormented with fire and sulfur in the presence of the Lamb and his angels. Uh, the angels uh, who we have known up to this point as being those who protect are no longer doing such. And Christ is no longer interceding for them. The picture here is of Sodom and Gomorrah. And I mean, that's where the fire and wrath and sulfur kind of the imagery that's being used. Uh, it's more symbolic of uh, a Sodom and Gomorrah kind of destruction. Now, someone will quickly say, well, what happened to Sodom and Gomorrah? Wiped out. So here we have what the, the folks like to call annihilationism. That is, those, will not, those who are against Christ will not suffer forever, but will just kind of be annihilated. But the text will not allow for that. The text will not allow for that, because it says forever and ever, uh, day and night. And the big image that, actually I think the thing that John wants to emphasize here um, is this line. They have no rest. They have no rest. The great promise for us is that at the return of Christ, uh, there is rest from the labors. Yeah? Jesus in Hebrews, according to Hebrews, Jesus is our Sabbath rest now and will be forever. Um, and so um, the Garden of Eden was a place of, of uh, in, a, in that sense, kind of a, a rest. Um, and the new heavens and new earth will be a place of rest. And here there is no rest. Uh, as Marjorie likes to say, there is no rest for the wicked. Um, and so uh, there you go. In my Bible it says, and their works do follow them. We'll, t- we'll get there in a second. We'll get there in a second. Okay. Sorry, I jumped. You did, and you jumped actually down to thirteen. You you jumped down to thirteen. We're not quite there. Uh, now this is where it gets interesting. Uh, so to those who are uh, standing in opposition to the church, this is utterly terrifying stuff, and hopefully something that drives to repentance, seeking mercy. But for the saints, it's a call to endurance, to keep the commands of God and their faith in Jesus. Now, now, why would this be a call to that? What do you think? Evangelism, I clearly see, is super important. Yep, but that's not what the text says. It doesn't, it's not a call to evangelism. It's a call to endurance. Why would we be called to endure? What are we enduring first? Persecution? Yes. Correct. The Supreme Court doesn't like you anymore, so endure, right? Move on from that, Sheldon. Um, uh, the, the, what we have here is, look, uh, same thing. Remember when we studied Hebrews like 25 years ago? And in the book of Hebrews, the author was continually saying, basically, don't leave the faith. You're suffering. It's difficult. It's hard. Do not abandon Christ. Don't turn back to the Old Testament Jewish religion. Don't go back to the shadows and the types. 
remain in Christ. The entire Old Testament was pointing to him. Just because you're suffering now doesn't mean you should return to that because what is waiting for you is far greater. Or we think of Paul's words to us recently in 2 Corinthians. Uh, I, consider my, um, I consider my temporary struggles uh, to be nothing in comparison with the weight of glory that awaits us. The weight of glory far outweighs the suffering that we endure now. Further, if we leave the faith now because of the hardship, this is what we have to look forward to. So don't give up. The alternative is not very good. Does that make sense? It's, it makes for earthly pleasure. Uh, but remember Jesus says, he who denies me before the world, I will deny before the Father. Um, and that's, so endure. Continue to confess Christ even if it means the death of you. See, um, or the torture of you. Because those who have bowed to the beast have far more to worry about. Okay? You're just, he's so nice. My head's not at the point of explosion yet, see. This morning I was about to lose. All right, go ahead. Thank you. That's very kind of you. Thank you, Ron. That's a hole in one. Okay. Um, so, call to endurance. Um, oh, and now we've just, we've just completely abandoned the gospel of, of Lutheranism altogether, right? Because their deeds follow them. Now, before we get to the deeds following them, I heard a voice from heaven saying, Write this. Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Blessed indeed, says... The Spirit. Oh, look at that. That guy's usually pretty quiet. Uh, but, you know, although, I mean, the whole book is his, so maybe not. But um, <laughs> they that, that they may rest from their labors. Now, we'll stop there and get to the works business in a second. Uh, but notice this. Why are those who die in the Lord blessed? They didn't falter or... Right, right. From the text, though, what does the text say? From now on. Why are they blessed from now on? Because they receive... Salvation. Rest from their labors. Very good, what the sentence says. They receive rest from their labors. Now, uh, what labors? Their, what's that? Their hard work. What other labor that we were just discussing? They're of per, their persecution. Their persecution has come to an end. Uh, the struggles and the trials and the sins and the attacks and the temptations and all of that comes to an end and now they are to rest. Now they are to rest. Okay? So it's a beautiful thing. And their deeds follow them. Now, this is true. It's true for those who are damned and it is true for those who are saved. Their deeds follow them. Do their deeds save them? No. Do their deeds precede them? No, they follow them. And you know what the Lord says to his saints on the day of judgment? Well done, good and faithful servant. When I was hungry, you fed me. When I was thirsty, you gave me something to drink. When I was naked, you clothed me. And we say, uh, right. <laughs> oh, yeah, I remember. When was that again? Are you, I remember, but I want to see Jesus if you remember when I did that. So when did that happen? And Jesus says, whenever you did it for the least of these, you did it for me. Whenever you loved your neighbor and served them and cared for them, and uh, that's when you were serving me. Well done. And all Christ sees as your good works. Like, this is amazing to me. We, we get to this passage and, that in Matthew 25 and say, see, there it is, works righteousness. Those who are saved are saved because they're kind to people, and those who are damned are damned because um, uh, they, they rejected their neighbor and they've only served themselves. And I would say yes to the latter, but to the former. What's remarkable there is that Jesus doesn't even bring up their sins. He doesn't say, I've got the books out, here's the bad stuff you did, here's the good stuff you did. The only thing he's got in the ledger there is what you've done well. That's all he's talking about. It's like God before the bad parts of Job. When the devil comes up there and starts accusing Job, and God says, have you seen my servant Job? Oh, he's fantastic. I just love watching my servant Job. That's the picture you have there in Matthew 25. It's not good people get in and bad people get out, but Jesus saying to you, oh, I loved watching it when you were doing this. You were doing it for me. And here is the same idea. Christ is pleased with your works. Because you are in Him, there's no condemnation left for you. There's absolutely no point to bring up the bad stuff either. Why? 
what's the point? To make you think about it for a little while? Right, no, it's done. Dead in the grave, washed clean, nailed to the cross, far as the east is from the west. Yeah? All right. So, so what's the point of bringing up the good stuff? Because God wants to, I mean, the sa- I think it would be the same thing like... To make you feel good. Yeah, you know, when I get home and I see that Mark has actually built something good with his Legos, which, by the way, that kid with Legos... He's going to be an engineer, which actually scares me more than most things. Like, that's good. <laughs> Another Dave. I don't look at these guys. Uh, the other day, the neighbor boy says to him, Mark, what do you want to be when you grow up? I want to be a construction worker. And the neighbor boy says, no, 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 no. You want to be a foreman because they're in charge of the construction workers. And Mark goes, I want to be a construction worker. Because <laughs> I like to build. Um, but the idea is to get to your question ultimately when I go home and I say Mark that is fantastic it's just another it's just another vocalization of my love for him and that's what I think the day of judgment is another way of Christ saying another way of saying I love you another way of saying you're mine that even your works I'm pleased with something like that um, not a sort of ranking which I think we always tend to do well my crown will be bigger because I, I, I clothed more naked Jesuses than you did like that's not the point the point is Jesus ultimately judges us and he's on our side See, so that's good news okay good yes the question was I ran into somebody once upon a time and, and they said well show and you must be collecting your gems in heaven yep, I right. never heard of such a yeah it's First Thessalonians um, and there's another verse of somewhere in the Corinthians that talks about uh, gem, gems in our crown in heaven or something like this. But you know, what's very curious about those verses, in Thessalonians, it comes up multiple places in the, in the scriptures, but I think Thessalonians is the most helpful because there it specifies what they are. And what Paul says is to the Thessalonians, uh, he's praising them because here's one church who's basically actually getting it right. Uh, and he's thrilled with what he hears about what's going on there. He, procl- he was their pastor. He was their preacher. And they came to faith through him. And then he's left. And they're continuing on in the faith. And so he says to them, you are the jewels in my crown. That is, when he gets to heaven, his joy will be in looking upon those that God used him to save. And other- So it's not sort of, I get a better seat because you guys are doing a good job but rather his joy will be in seeing uh, Christ has used him to preach the gospel into the lives of those people. They're the jewels in his crown. His glory is not in some selfish piece of metal with pretty rocks in it, but his glory is in the fact that people have believed because Christ worked through him. Right, that's... Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, okay. So, and I think that's a beautiful picture, actually. Because you know what it does? The way I pictured it to be. Yeah, it's better because... If you give physical gems... Yep. It's going to be a jealousy thing. Well, it won't because their jealousy there won't be jealousy there. Um, but, but because in heaven, person. see, I think in heaven we won't even think about ourselves. We'll be staring at Jesus in awe and singing songs and we'll look over while the heavenly chorus is going on to verse 2 and we'll say, "Whoa! That was someone who was in church with me in Bible study." Hot dog. And they'll look over and they'll say something like, it's what you said. And we'll be like, no kidding. Let's sing. You know, I mean, like, this is gonna, it's just going to be that. And then they'll pass the wine and the, and the turkey legs and all whatever we're eating. It's just going to be wonderful. Um, and it won't be any sort of, you know, they got a higher seat than I did. Wine and turkey legs. <laughs> and you're worried about this the finest. percentage of alcohol. Hey, look, look. If the scriptures say it will be a feast with the, with the greatest of meats and the finest of wines. And I love that verse, and I will cling to it. Um, it is the gospel. It's an Isaiah. Um, okay. Good. Do you guys know I'm going to go home and have a glass of water after this? Okay. Wednesday, Wednesday nights always drive me to a glass of water. Uh, then I looked and behold... Wednesday, morning. <sighs> Wednesday mornings, no. No, I have enough. <laughs> Never mind. Never mind. If Wednesday mornings drove me to drink, uh, I would have a problem. No, never mind. Okay. Then I looked and behold, a white cloud. Uh, let someone else, someone else read. I need to stop talking. Um, can someone read 14 through 20 for us, please? Go, Tom. Yeah, Tom, please. Thank you. 
I looked, and there before me was a white cloud, and seated on the cloud was one like the Son of Man, with a crown of gold on his head, and a sharp sickle in his hand. Then another angel came out of the temple, and called in a loud voice to him who was sitting on the cloud, Take your sickle and reap, because the time to reap is come, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. So he who was seated on the cloud swung his sickle over the earth, and the earth was harvested. How far are you on to read? The okay. rest of the chapter. Okay. Another angel came out of the temple in heaven, and he too had a sharp sickle. Still another angel, who had, who had charge of the fire, came from the altar and called in a loud voice to him who had the sharp sickle. Take your sharp sickle and gather the clusters of grapes from the earth's vine, because its grapes are ripe. The angel swung his sickle on the earth, gathered its grapes, and threw them into the great winepress of God's wrath. They were trampled in the winepress outside the city, and blood flowed out of the press, rising as high as a horse's bridle for a distance of 1,600 stadia. Stadia, yeah. Stadia. Yeah. Good. <laughs> How far that is. We're, uh, this is what I'm reading to the kids at night. It's very strange. Um, okay. <laughs> Then I looked, I'm not, no, no, heavens no. no. Uh, then I looked and behold a white cloud, uh, seated on the white cloud was like a son of man. Uh, who's that? Jesus. Jesus, right? And with a golden crown on his head and a sharp sickle in his hand. Now, where is the sharp sickle? What, is, what does this mean? I want to say the Grim Reapers. Thing. Yeah, this is what people, I think someone else said that. I think Marjorie said the Grim Reaper. Yeah, this is, uh, I mean, yes, but Jesus is not depicted here as the Grim Reaper at all. He's not in a dark cloak. The tool is what He's not. Yeah, yeah, that's the right tool. You're right. Use a sickle to the, reap. Yeah, the sickles for reaping. Yeah, that is correct. And I, I think I know why Sheldon and I kind of thought of that initially. In today's world, you know, we don't really use this kind of tool as much. Right. And this would have been a very common tool. We only think of it today. The Grim Reaper, that, Grim correct. Reaper. Very good. Okay, okay. Uh, so the sharp sickle... Is used for harvesting, cutting stuff down. Yes. No, sure, sorry. Uh huh. I actually tried to use a sickle one time. Yeah. <laughs> we bought this piece of property where our house was built. Uh huh. And it had to be cleared, you know, June first, right? I bought a sickle. Thinking I'm gonna sickle all those weeds down. It lasted about a minute, maybe a thirty seconds. Before I said I, I couldn't sharpen that thing sharp enough actually cut those weeds. I don't know how anybody ever used a sickle to cut anything. Interesting. It was awful. I went and bought a weed or borrowed a, or a, rented a weed whacker. Well, not a weed whacker. Which <laughs> <laughs> is not a sickle. The, the, the weed whacker has less of the uh, rhetorical impact yeah, as the yeah. sickle, I think, here. <laughs> yeah, this uh, is not <laughs> that long, you know. And, really? And I just saw myself just going around going, shh. And the weeds would just come down and, you know, and that's how I'd always see the movies. Yeah. <laughs> that's pretty amazing. No way. No way. <laughs> There's a secret to it. There must be. Yeah. What's the Nobody secret, Dave? Well, it, it's, it's got to be a slicing action. If you just try to force it through, it won't, um, it won't cut. But if you when you pull it around, you're actually pulling it towards you. It'll cut because you're actually slicing it. See, if I'd have known that, I wouldn't have to buy it. That's why. Well, it's the way you you'd have still bought the. Pulling it towards you cuts it, otherwise it well, just bends over. It just bends over. Yeah. You gotta have an engineer around. See, it's always helpful. Yeah. 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 All right, so here's here's Jesus coming to judge on a white cloud. Now the cloud depicts, you know, this is always how the second coming of Christ is depicted, right? He comes again in, in clouds to judge the living and the dead. You'll see Jesus return again in the clouds of glory, that kind of stuff. So this is the final judgment scene here. Once again, we're coming to the end of the world in the Book of Revelation <laughs> for like the fourth time now. All right, uh, round and round we go. Uh, so uh, here he comes in the white cloud, seated like the son of man a uh, golden crown on his head sharp sickle in his hand the crown before the crown was thorny now it's royal all right this is jesus not coming in humility this is jesus coming in judgment okay um, and then here uh with this sickle this imagery we have can somebody go very quickly to matthew 13 matthew 13 and read verses 24 through 30 
Yes, please. Matthew yes. The kingdom of heaven is like a farmer who planted a good seed in the field. But that night, as the workers slept, his enemy came and planted weeds among the wheat and slipped away. And the crop began to grow and produce it. When the crop began to grow and produce grain, the weeds also grew. The farmer's workers went to him and said, Sir, the field where you planted the good seed is full of weeds. Where did they come from? And then he has done this, the farmer explained. Should we pull out the weeds, they asked. No, they replied. Who will root the wheat if you do? Let both grow together until the harvest. Then I will tell the harvesters to sort out the weeds, tie them into bundles, and burn them. Okay, now the parable means this. Jesus explains it in just a little bit. Uh, the parable means this. The one who sows the good seed is the Son of Man, is Jesus, uh, planting his church, and the field is uh, the earth. And so he's planting a seed in the earth. It's, gr- it's raising people who believe. But then the enemy comes along, and that's the devil, and he sows weeds uh, amidst the wheat. And those are the unbelievers. This is not a picture of the church, which it's often depicted as, but rather a picture of the world. Um, and so um, the, 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 those who go out to reap and to gather, those are the angels on the day of judgment who gather uh, uh, those who are to be judged and they separate the wheat from the tares. Uh, and those who have been weeds uh, will be thrown into the one barn and those who are the, to be burned up and those who are the wheat will be saved to everlasting life. That, that's the idea of what's going on here. So it's a judgment parable, uh, much like the one we're seeing here um, in Revelation chapter 14, much like what we're hearing here in Revelation chapter 14. This picture of the harvest means, if you're living in that kind of a culture, that agricultural uh, imagery, um, agrarian, is that the right word, agrarian culture, uh, the harvest means the work is done. Everything's pretty much finished. Uh, It's time for the end of all of this work and the work of, of sorting and all that's about to be complete. That's what the day of judgment is. It's the end of all this stuff. Okay? Uh, So that's the imagery we have here. So the angel comes out of the temple, uh, calling with a loud voice to him who sat on the cloud, put in your sickle and reap, for the hour to reap has come, for the harvest of the earth is fully ripe. Now, uh, here's an angel telling Jesus what to do. Don't worry, the angel's coming from the temple. And who's in the temple? The Father. So the Father's sending the angel, saying, now is the time. Um, There's that strange verse where Jesus says, no one knows the day or the hour but the Father. Well, everybody knows now. See? (coughs) Um, uh, Jesus we think knows that as it is right now but never mind Uh, so he who sat on the cloud swung the sickle across the earth and the earth was reaped okay so this is the fulfillment of the parable that Carol just read to us all right Um, anything else to say at this point Um, Joel 4 has similar scene in which God's judgment is depicted Um, it's, it's actually remarkably similar to this but we don't need to well so I want to go there real quick to Joel chapter 4. I'll do it real quick. Joel 4, 12 through 13. Um, it says, well, that's funny because Joel doesn't have a chapter 4. Uh, 3, 13. 3, 12, and 13. Thank you. Uh, Let the nation stir themselves up and come to the valley of Jehoshaphat. For there I will sit to judge all the surrounding nations. Put in the sickle, for the harvest is ripe. Go in, tread, for the uh, winepress is full. The vats overflow, for the evil is great. So there, uh, it actually gets more into the next image of of the grape harvest here. Uh, But the the imagery is still very similar. We're now coming to a judgment scene. Okay. Uh, And another angel comes out of the temple in heaven, and he also has a sharp sickle. And another angel came from the altar. The angel who has authority over the fire. Now, where have we experienced, what altar and fire are we talking about here? In the temple. What what did we say that was? Does anyone remember? Isn't that the one where it was the the prayers of those who had been persecuted? Yes. So the angel of that altar, who has been in the presence of those prayers, crying out for justice, is the one coming out most likely. Sort of saying, all right, so the prayers have been heard, and now we're coming to deliver the justice. Okay. Okay, uh, and notice in Jesus' parable that Carol read to us, it's the angels um, who are doing the, the reaping and the gathering. And that's what we see here. Another, uh, and he called out with a loud voice to the one who had the sharp sickle, put in your sickle and gather the clusters from the vine of the earth for its grapes are ripe. So the angel sung his sickle across the earth and gathered the grape harvest of the earth and threw it in the great wine press of the wrath of God. 
Delightful. Uh, here are more angels. Let's see. I have a question. Yep. So when we pray for the Christians that are being persecuted in other countries as we speak on Sundays, yep. those prayers aren't going to be answered until this time? Maybe. Maybe sooner. So they might not be answered that following day? Or... No. It's in God's time. They will be answered, though. All, all of God's answers are yes and amen. Uh, so they will be answered. They will be, but yeah. just not when we want uh, Maybe. Yeah, I can't yeah, say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. Um, um, the gathering of grains have now changed to the gathering of the grapes. Um, before the in-gathering focused on all people, that first little vision there of the grains was kind of talking about everybody being gathered. Uh, but here it's talking specifically um, about the unbelievers who are being gathered in for the wrath of God. And this is a very, again, a very violent picture of God's wrath. Um, before in the text, the idolaters drank the cup of wrath. Now their blood fills it. Um, again, Jesus oversees, um, Jesus is overseeing this, but he gives the task of separating to the angels. So notice um, he's sort of meeting out this work to be done, uh, which is kind of interesting, that Jesus is not carrying it out uh, kind of personally. Um, I wonder if that doesn't make us think about um, the Passover. Yeah? The angel of death comes. Um, it's not Jesus who comes down, but the angel of death. Um, he, has an a he has agents for his wrath kind of stuff. So. Um, Jesus at that point has already done enough yeah, he's not, yeah, he's, yeah, yeah. That's interesting. I don't know. I, I'm not going to expand anymore on that. It's just something to think about. Um, the wine press was trodden. Now, I think this is interesting. Outside the city. Uh, outside the city is kind of a loaded term. Where was Jesus crucified? Outside the city. So where's the place of God's wrath? Outside the city. Once again, we come back to this idea that, look, God's wrath has been satisfied in Christ. And if you want to deal with God apart from Christ, you will only be outside the city in that wrath. Go ahead, Tom. What city would that be? J well, he's Jerusalem itself, but here we're going to talk of the heavenly Jerusalem. Um, let me get real quick before I go on. Um, remember the two... Uh, Good enough. Well, yeah, Jerusalem is the specific city there. But, but here I think we want to think of uh, the Zion that is above. The, Zion, the, the faith of God, something like that. Faith in Christ. Okay. Um, and the blood flows from the wine press as high as a horse's bridle, 1600 stadia. Um, so extensive and terrifying is this wrath that the blood flows for 184 miles. Um, and it's, the, it's up to a horse's bridle. So, so Rob Phillips is always happy to say um, to his friends who think that we should take this whole book literally, have you really thought about how much blood that is? <laughs> have you really considered the literalness of that much blood? Um, perhaps this is saying something else. And I, and I think it is. Uh, and I, I think we're going to, uh, once again, default to this idea that numbers are symbolic in the book of Revelation. Now let's play... What's that number? Wait a minute. Yeah. There's seven plus billion people on this earth. That's not a reasonable number. Here's what I'm going to say to you, Sheldon. I don't think on the day of judgment God is going to have a big bucket and put all the people in the bucket and walk on them so that blood starts oozing out all over the place. I think it's symbolic of God's wrath. I got caught again. It's okay. I'm, I was sarcastic and that was not fair. I'm sorry. It's been a it's long a day. Yeah. It's fair. Yeah, fair. But I, but I think it's more or less referring to the extensiveness of God's judgment. Go ahead. Uh, one Bible study I was in, we were trying to figure out how much blood would be involved in all the cattle that were sacrificed on the altar. Yeah. I mean, it's a lot. It's a lot of, of blood. It's a lot of blood. Yeah. Because yeah. if you think about it, 187 miles, that's from here to San Diego. Well, yeah, this is it. You're talking about the whole world and all the people on it? Yeah, but in this, so in this instance, we're talking about in the Old Testament when they, when they used to slaughter cattle, you know, as sacrifices. And it was a certain, it was, it was prescribed. You had, mm -hmm. to do, you had to do so many different things. And started figuring out how many 
people that were there and all the sins and how many cattle they were killing and say to yourself, that's a lot of blood. Yeah, that's it. It is. It's a lot of blood. You ever seen a cow bled before? I see him done something like that. It's, yeah. it's awful. I mean, it's it's awful. And it didn't say square miles either. It could have been. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So. Could have been nautical ah. miles, and they got a sail. <laughs> they were sailing in it. Oh gosh. Okay. <laughs> Thank you for that. That may be the best line of the class. All right. Um, the sixteen hundred. Let's play. What's that number? So sixteen hundred. Uh, what is the square root of sixteen hundred? Forty. Forty. Yes. It is? Yes. Nuts. Uh, <laughs> well, no, it's not. It's 40. Oh, yeah, 40 squared. It's 1,600. Um, oh, you nice. got yeah, I know. Ah. Yeah, 4 times 4 is 6. So I want to get back to 4. How do I get down to 4 from this? 4 times 4 times 1,000 is really what I want to get to. So, all right, so here we go. What does 4 symbolize? The earth. Four corners of the earth. Which means... The entirety of creation. Yes? Okay. Uh, what does 1,000 mean? The fullness, the fullness completeness, completeness, wholeness, the, and ex- the, 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 the beginning and the end, the completeness, right? Uh, and so if you take uh, 4 times 4, you get, and times 1,000, uh, you get 1,600. So the idea here... No. No. No, it's 4 times 4 times... What did I say? 1,600. That would be 16,000. That would be 16,000. What did I say? 4 times 4 times 100 is 1,600? That's correct. What did I say? You said 1,000. Oh, no, I'm sorry. 4 times 4 times 100. I'm sorry. I'm reading like two lines at one time. 4 times 4 times 100 is 1,600. I'm like, this this is right. I know this is right because I read it wrong. Uh, 4 times 4 times 100 is 1,600. Um, Dave's math problem is on Facebook makes me angry. Um, clearly, <laughs> nuts. So the whole idea here is this: the entirety of creation that stands opposed to Christ and His Church will suffer this punishment. Every one who stands opposed to God, it is a full and complete judgment. Does that make sense? Can I go with that? That's what the sixteen hundred represents. Keith, don't ask me how I got there. All right, it just did, and it's what my notes say. I don't, I don't look for uh, that level of computational accuracy from you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just. This isn't the White House. I, I, I don't look for accurate computers either. Okay, so. Huh? What did you say? I said, isn't the White House on 1600 Pennsylvania? Yes, and uh, no, do nothing with that. All right. <laughs> All right. King James Version. Divide the space of a thousand and six hundred furlongs. <laughs> yeah, it's also a thousand and six hundred furlongs. It is that too, or stadia. Uh, uh, let me see this. Um, but listen to um, <coughs> Isaiah sixty-three. Um, Isaiah 63, let's see where I want to begin. Uh, Who is this who comes from Edom in crimson garments from Basra? And he who is splendid in his apparel, marching in the greatness of his strength. It is I, speaking in righteousness, mighty to save. Why is your apparel red? And your garments like his who treads in the winepress? Well, I have trod in the winepress alone. And from the peoples, no one was with me. I trod them in my anger and trampled them in my wrath. Their lifeblood splattered on my garments and stained my apparel. For for the day of vengeance was in my heart, and my year of redemption had come. I looked, but there was no one to help. I was appalled, but there was no one to uphold. So my own arm brought me salvation, and my wrath upheld me. I trampled down the peoples with my anger. I made them drunk in my wrath, and I poured out their lifeblood on the earth. Yo, there it is. It's a vigilante. That is that is what we're getting here in Isaiah 63. So uh, this is the fulfillment of that prophecy, uh, that wrath that stands opposed to those who oppose Christ. Okay. Uh, Christ's judgment comes. It is full and it is complete. That's the idea of the 1600 stadium or 16,000 or whatever math you're using. Okay. 
this then is to um, not give us great deals of comfort, um, but to remind us of the ever pressing need of proclaiming the gospel to the world that stands opposed to Jesus. Okay? Yes? But also not to fear. Yeah, you don't need to fear this. These are not verses directed towards you, dear saint. For it's the Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. <laughs> but don't be selfish with that thing. No? Right. Good. Questions? Concerns? Calculators? Computational accuracy? Good. All right, you guys. Uh, next week, chapter 15, we get into the next vision. Um, the seven, another seven, the seven plagues, um, and the seven bowls of God's wrath. And so it just gets, it gets worse before it gets better. But it will get better. The stuff we're going to get at the end is just fantastic. So... Uh, well, let's let's sing the doxology and head home. Let's sing. <clears throat> Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Thanks for listening to this Bible study presentation from Faith Lutheran Church in Moorpark, California. We hope this has helped you grow in your Christian faith and study of the Bible. For more information, visit us on the web at faithmoorpark.com. Music by Kevin McLeod.